Honorable Members of Parliament, our reviewer, the country director for Christian Aid, our implementing partners from the Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Services, and from the district assemblies, our friends and partners in the media, staff of SEN, ladies and gentlemen. It is both, should I say, an obligation, a pleasure, and an honor for me to make a brief remarks on this occasion. I say it's an obligation because as the CEO of SEN, it is part of my job to always work on our guests to make them feel at home, and if you like, to empower them to help us do what we are supposed to do. But it is always a pleasure to welcome distinguished members of society of various institutions, the media, who come to work with us to exercise our duty especially when we have to welcome members of parliament. You know, I worked in Ghana for about 30 years. There were days were very difficult to access parliamentarians. Now, sometimes they come even when you don't invite them. That's how our democracy and that's how institution building is progressing. Even when we make little mistakes by not recognizing them, they don't take offense. So it's always, if you, if you travel the journey that I have traveled in Ghana, it's always a pleasure and an honor to experience the growth of our democracy. So members of parliament, I extend to you a special welcome. Because we know that the work that we do as SEN, I always say that we see ourselves as on pay and serve on television, they hear themselves in the radio, but they also see themselves in the print media. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on our partnership with the media because through them we are able to sustain the voices, the agonies, and sometimes the successes of the poor and of government. So I always like to welcome them. Now today I'm supposed to welcome you to a very special report. I'm not going to go into it. I'm sure that I will have some time to make a remark again or to answer questions. But today we're going to, uh, we are here on a long journey that SEN has been on, working in the health sector. Uh, we've launched quite a number of reports, whether it's Ghana National Health Service, whether it's on the budget, or whether it's uh, the health insurance. Today we are on that journey again, where we are looking at a very important part of health service delivery, the delivery of health towards uh, safe motherhood. So it is my pleasure, it is also my honor, but more importantly, it is my duty to welcome each and every one of you, and especially our chair. Thank you very much. They serve on television, they hear themselves in the radio, but they also see themselves in the print media. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on our partnership with the media because through them we are able to sustain the voices, the agonies, and sometimes the successes of the poor and of government. So I always like to welcome them. Now today I'm supposed to welcome you to a very special report. I'm not going to go into it, I'm sure that I will have some time to make a remark again or to answer questions. But today we're going to, uh, we are here on a long journey that SEN has been on, 
working in the health sector. Uh, we've launched quite a number of reports, whether it's Ghana National Health Service, whether it's on the budget, or whether it's uh, the health insurance. Today we are on that journey again, where we are looking at a very important part of health service delivery, the delivery of health towards uh, safe motherhood. So it is my pleasure, it is also my honor, but more importantly, it is my duty to welcome each and every one of you, and especially our chair. Thank you very much. They are becoming more and more passionate about the real issues that affect us as Ghanaians. I'm a journalist through and through, so a lot of protocols forgive me if I don't observe them. But um, distinguished guests here in Gathered, the launch of the report today, most of the issues stipulated in it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. I think we all know it, unless we want to join the bandwagon and um, look at issues with the, ND, the usual NDC and PP um, lenses. Otherwise, we do know. But what is important about this report is the startling revelation of statistics and real life issues. Financing of the health sector involves a lot. It includes provision of facilities, equipment, resourcing staff, training, provision of medication and drugs, the national health insurance system, attitude of health professionals, it goes a long way. It, it covers a broad spectrum. If you're a woman, there's nothing as painful as witnessing or hearing or getting to know about a woman who dies all because she wants to deliver or she wants to have a baby. If you're a man, you panic especially if you're married and your wife is pregnant, when you hear that a woman had died through childbirth, or a woman had, has lost a baby through childbirth, or even after the baby has been born. With what I do, I hear real life stories all the time. And sometimes we are angry. When I was giving the brief, I couldn't go through it because halfway I was so angry. And I keep asking myself the question, why? Interestingly, in our country, the health sector received the second highest kick of the national budget. That's what we, have to, we are told. This year in the budget, the health sector is going to be given, or is expected to be given, just a little over 3 billion Ghana cities. According to the budget, when you Google it, I mean, the Ministry of Health has done a good job. They have um, this abridged version called the Citizen Budget. It's very simple to read and self-explanatory. So you Google it, you go to the website, you read it, you understand the various sectors, what is going in and what is expected to be done. This year, they are promising to upgrade the Tamale Health, uh, Hospital, which is an area covered by this report as well as the northern region. They promised to expand, to continue to expand the CHIPS compound and, you know, um, build some more CHIPS compound and other health sectors. It's all well and good. But you ask yourself on the ground, what is really happening? What is really happening? The doctor to patient ratio, it's heartbreaking. When WHO says one to thousand six hundred, one doctor to thousand six hundred in Ghana, it's one to about ten thousand something. But in the regions that this report has focused on, one region is getting to one doctor to about fifty three thousand and over. Now that is sad. That is sad. And with no apologies, sometimes I wonder. Our various governments, over the years, when they signed the treaties and international conventions, you wonder, do they really understand what they signed? Or is it a case that they don't read it? 
Or could it be that they just sign it and they are not committed to it? Or we just don't know how to find the money to implement it? So many questions go through your mind when you sit and analyze what we face in this country. And it didn't start just now. It's been going on over the years. So I plead with my colleagues here that even as we listen to the various analysis and the review, we do not follow the craziness that has engulfed our country these days and see it with a political lens. But we really take our time to understand and feel how people on the ground feel and how it's affecting them. Fortunately and unfortunately, now I've been moved from my Fanti area to the Akwemu area. And of course, with what I do and who I am, immediately I go, what I do is look out for the women and children. Along my husband's area, the Akwemu area, I mean, starting from after Kosombo, about 10 villages along that straight, straight line. You don't have to turn left or right. Along that straight route, road, there are about 10 villages, only one health post. With a nurse who has been there for over 20, 80 years. I believe the health sector has even forgotten about her, that she's there. She's well past her retirement age, but she's there. A doctor comes in every now and then. Our village alone, we are well, almost 800,000, 800 people, I beg your pardon, getting to 1,000. There are other towns and villages along that that are bigger than Edumasa. So you can imagine, there are a lot of farmers, women in there. When they are sick, this midwife, they call her Auntie Rose. She is a doctor, nurse, everything. People come and they go. Because the building is there, but you go in there and you wonder what they work with. I'm happy about this report. And if you leave me, I will talk and talk and talk with a lot of passion and anger in my voice. But here, we are here today to really understand the issues, making safe motherhood a reality. And I believe every single one of us here was born by a woman. And we either want to have a child or we want to see our wives give us children. So we all need to take it seriously. And once again, I'll plead with my media colleagues that don't let it end with this launch. Let us go further to interrogate the issues, get to the grounds, and find out what is really going on. The human aspect of it. Give us a human face for the people out there to listen. As for our politicians here, I need not say much. I'm sure they know what I'm thinking and what I really wish to say. But thank you for this opportunity to be um, is it selected or chosen to chair this very important launch. And I hope and pray that everything goes on well, that everybody will leave here with our heads bowed down, but determined to lift our head high so we can do something about it. Thank you very much. Um, Ohine Yuri, Dr. Gifty Anti, um, CEO of SEND, Dr. Kamara, our reviewer, um, Dr. Gordon Abekan Krumah, honorable parliamentarians, my colleagues from Christian Aid and friends from SEND Ghana, our friends from the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I bring you greetings from Christian Aid. As an organization that has been in existence for about 70 years around the world, even though we are quite new in Ghana, um, not very new, we are about, uh, we are approaching 10 years, 10 years in Ghana, so, um, and, and this is an organization that works with citizens across the world to challenge institutions, to challenge people in authority, to hold governments to accountable for their actions and their inactions that perpetuate poverty. And what we try to do is to work with people across the world to eradicate poverty. 
And one of the things we do is to promote citizens' engagement so that they can engage with the people that are in authority in their districts or at the very local levels of governance and to hold them to accountable so that they can be responsive to their needs, to the needs of the people at the grassroots level. Today we are here once again talking about maternal health. And as the chairperson said, this is not a surprising topic. This is not a new topic. This is something I'm sure that most of you have lost count of, of the number of times you've heard about the issues of maternal mortality in this country. And even though the records show that since 2000, Ghana has made some strides in improving maternal mortality. You probably know already that, that the statistics are still very bad. They are not encouraging at all. Um, doctor to patient ratio, I, as you, you heard already, um, is showing one doctor to 53,000 people in, one, in, in some of the areas that we've looked at. Um, medical equipment in short supply in many of the places. Our maternal mortality rates, as, as the records are showing now, are hovering around 350 to 380 per 100,000 live births, as against the MDG target of 185. Madam Chairperson, think about it, ladies and gentlemen, 185 per 100,000 live births. I think the more you think about this, it should, it should upset everybody in this country. Even if you think about the 185, who is, that, who is supposed to be included in the 185? <laughs> is that me? Is it my mother? My sisters? Is that you, ladies? And gentlemen here, is that your sisters, your cousins? Who is supposed to be in that? And yet we are talking 350, 380 per every 100,000 live birth. That's where we are as a country. And therefore, there needs to be something that, that, that we do about it. And I'm hoping that this report launch serves as an opportunity for us to pause, reflect, and think about what actions we can take. In 2013, we approached the, United, uh, the, the European Union and, and made them a proposal and said that we would like to partner a credible organization, um, St. Ghana, and go into the northern part of Ghana and work in 30, 30 districts to address maternal mortality issues. And part of that process is what has culminated in, the, in this report that is going to be launched um, today. And I do hope that as the issues are highlighted from the report, we can all think about that and use that as a call for action, a call for our politicians for our people in government to start thinking about what do we need to do in this country to address maternal mortality. When we tout the, the health budgets around 15% of the national CAG, when you go on the ground, how much is actually allocated to health? And around the health budget itself, how much of that goes into maternal mortality? And these are the issues. And that's why in this project, for which we are launching this project, there are three things we seek to do. One of them, one of them is that we empower and work with citizens at the grassroots level so that they themselves can get up and say how much is going into maternal mortality in our districts, in our communities. The second thing is to work with structures at the grassroots level, such as community networks and so on and so forth, and say, can you go to your district assemblies yourself, your MMDAs and departments of health and so on and so forth, and ask them questions around how much is going into maternal mortality. And the third is that we, we partner the media to project the voice of citizens around maternal mortality. And I hope that by the end of this project, um, even though we would not have addressed all the issues of maternal mortality in Ghana, it would have served as an opportunity to highlight issues around this area um, to attract the necessary actions. On this note, I wish us all uh, a fruitful report to lunch, and I, and I hope that uh, we can take the issues forward. Thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Through the reports, and I think yesterday I was asking uh, Clara that I'm a typical academic 
and so if you ask me to review a report then probably I will be singing this uh, I, I would be I would be reciting the early versions of this poem which says that friends Roman countrymen lend me your ears I've come to bury Caesar and not to praise him but today I don't think that I've come to bury St. Gan. <laughs> So basically, we're looking. Okay. So basically, we're looking at making safe motherhood a reality, the issue of financing. And so my first issue is to look at the relevance of the title. Is it important we talk about making safe motherhood a reality? Yes, I think so. I think it's really important, and and for me, it's a passionate issue to look at. As a researcher, I'm a typical economist, and my interest is about looking at the nexus between poverty and reproductive health, gender, reproductive health, gender, and food security. So whenever I hear issues about reproductive health, it's important to me. I've just come from a conference uh, 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 sponsored by the West African Health Organization where I'm trying to look at how evidence actually informs the policies that we make in Ghana. And so for me, this is important. And it is important because first, it talks about MDD five, uh, MDG5. I think that unless something miraculous happens within the next 27 days, we know very well that we are not achieving MDG5. And that in itself is important for us to be talking about this. And secondly, I think that it's important we talk about this because I can't fathom why the expectations of household joy can suddenly be turned into chaos and sorrow. And I guess you understand what I'm talking about. Because when a woman carries pregnancy for nine months, and I remember how it happened with my, with, with my first boy, and how I was with my wife throughout in the UK, I stopped almost everything, and then I decided to do all the household chores, doing everything, and my heart beat, especially within the first three months. And then delivery, how I was at the theater myself, throughout the CS, took the baby, everything, and, and it was such a sense of pride and joy. So I can't imagine why others should go through this process that is supposed to be a joyous moment and yet they come out of the hospital I mean with with an issue they never want to remember or a scar that never goes away and for me the third point is the fact that everything that we need to do to be able to deal with this is known Every single intervention that we need to be able to ensure that we do maybe two or three uh, 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 deaths per 100,000 live births like you find in the UK, these interventions are known. And it, it, it is not with respect to context. They are applicable across geography. And so for me, given the fact that we know all the interventions, then the question that comes to mind is why is it that the situation is what it is. I think that it comes down to resources and the commitment to deal with it. And so if I find a report that looks at a disaggregated situation, especially in the three northern regions, and provides detailed information in terms of investment in uh, safe motherhood, then I think that that organization should be commended for that work done. So that's, that's, for me, is the first part in terms of whether this report is relevant. Then let's also look at the scope that the report covers, because the report claims it wants to look at safe motherhood. And so if I take any report like that, I would want to look at the very essential input into safe motherhood and want to see whether the report looked at disaggregated investment within the three northern regions in terms of the key interventions that goes into safe motherhood. And basically within the literature, what are we talking about? We're talking about things like family planning, antenatal care, skill delivery, emergency obstetric and newborn care, postnatal care, comprehensive abortion, and then post 
uh, mother to child transmission. And the report tends to cover almost all these areas in terms of how there have been inflows and then expenditures. And so in that sense, I think that the report tends to do pretty quite well in that area. And so having looked at the coverage, my next issue to look at is the content of the report itself. I would look at that by looking at the background and how the report moves into eight objectives. I'll look at the methodology and then I'll look at the findings. And then I'll look at other things that I think that we've basically lost track of that is important we've got to discuss, especially when the media is here and they have the capacity to carry that particular message. So in terms of the background, I think that the report begins by looking at uh, 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 the macro level uh, uh, issues in terms of what, how we've been uh, faring, talks about the fact that we've been doing pretty well. And I think that sometimes we, we also carry the stick too much on ourselves and then we refuse to talk about the successes that we've chalked because I think that I'm, I'm an optimist, okay? And I believe that we need a certain sort of light to be able to shine our part and then carry on. So it's important we acknowledge the successes that we've chalked over the last two decades. I mean, if you look at the implementation of our, the onset of Ghana swaps, and the introduction of systematic approaches to policy planning in Ghana, starting with the POWs, the first one in 1997, I'm talking about the medium-term health strategy, through to the POWs, uh, uh, one, two, three, and then we are with the current one, which I think begins 2014 and ends in 2017. And I think through these approaches, the country has done incredibly well. If you look at the fact that over the last almost 20 years, we've managed to cut down maternal mortality by about 49%, which, which is pretty good. But that is not to say that that's the end of the game. And again, if you compare Ghana in the context of its neighbors, you can say that Ghana is doing pretty well because, so, for instance, if you compare Ghana to our neighbor, Nigeria, Nigeria is doing around 560 uh, 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 deaths per 100,000 life beds. Sierra Leone is doing about 1,100 uh, uh, per uh, uh, 100,000 life beds. So if you look at it in this context, then you can say that the story is not what? All bleak. But again, I would want to also compare Ghana to its contemporaries in Latin America, countries that are of the same size and shape and, and, and resources like Ghana. If you look at countries like Paraguay, they're doing 18 per 100,000 life beds. And so it means that we have a long way to go. What it means is that there is the need for targeted investment, credible commitment, and passion to drive those investments towards some kind of success. So by acknowledging that, I think that the report does very well in that uh, uh, stead. And then the report also talks about the, the, the issue of inequities in terms of distribution of resources. Uh, uh, against the three northern regions. And I think that that point is spot on because if you look, it, it doesn't matter which report you look at, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is budget, whatever you talk, whether it's education, the three northern regions are always what discriminated against in terms of the kinds of uh, investment that goes on there. So I think that these two things put together tries to justify the geography of the research in terms of picking the three northern regions. And the report talks about clearly looking at sources and flow of funding for maternal health services delivery and then utilization of these resources for uh, delivery. So having looked at that, I think the next issue to look at is the methodology that was applied uh, in carrying out the research. And I think that is pretty much straightforward. Basically, maybe what I would have wanted to see is a little more information in terms of the basis because I see a selection of uh, health facilities, uh, DHMTs, and in the report, you don't get a lot more information about the basis for sampling these uh, uh, facilities. And so there is the possibility for somebody to conclude that these facilities were selected in a manner that will bias the findings towards a certain angle. Maybe that is not the case. And so if a lot more information had been provided to that effect, that would have been uh, better and that would have strengthened uh, the report. So I would move straight to findings because I don't have too much to talk about in terms of uh, 
the, the, the methodology. So the findings, the first one is about the sources and allocation of maternal, maternal health resources. And the report gives a lot of information, both at the macro and micro level, which I think is commendable. And two key things that I pick from this point is about the issues of variances between budgets and uh, 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 actual expenditure. And I think that this thing is being with us for a very, very long time. And, and I think that it's also a function of the approach that is used for budgeting. Of course, we claim to be doing bottom up and sometimes it's confused with top down because those guys there will do what I normally would call a wish list anyway, and then they will send and the Ministry of Finance will decide what we're going to give you. And sometimes even what they decide is based on whether they get the money or they don't get. And uh, those of us who are interested, there is this research uh, going on in uh, uh, where I've, I've come from, not the University of Ghana. I recently came to the University of Ghana. I was in the University of Manchester. You have what you call the effective state research, and they're looking at political settlement because the whole assumption is that, look, that the, the theories are there, but until we find a way to align elite interest to our development goals, we are not going anywhere because we will plan anyway. The politician will come and tell you that, all right, I think this is where the votes are going to come from. So go and put the facility here, whether it's, it's worth it or not. And so these things, I, I've, I've looked at reports from, the, from, from 2006 up to now. Every time you look at the health sector report, these uh, variances always are there. And so I think that it's a good thing that the reports uh, point out. Now, another thing that I, 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 I saw in the report, which I think is striking, is the relative importance of IGF as a source of revenue, both for facilities and then specifically for reproductive health. For me, it was incredible to be looking at revenues coming from reproductive health, because that for me is a bit inconsistent, because there is supposed to be this policy of what? Free uh, 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 antenatal care, free deliveries. So if hospitals are making revenues from reproductive care, it doesn't add up. It, it's, it's some kind of, I would have preferred to hear a lot more clarity on that. Because if hospitals are making revenues, then it means that they are charging. Maybe I would engage uh, the authors of the report to understand this. But if that is what is the case, then that is an issue to flag. And, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's good that we have the honorable members of parliament here because they are supposed to be our mouthpiece in parliament and speak for us, not for government, because we sent them there to do our bidding and not the bidding of uh, government. So, so these two areas are pretty much key. And I'm going to be talking about the relevance of IGF in the context of sustainability of our health insurance later on and how it pans out in our capacity to achieve our safe motherhood targets later on. Okay, so, so um, then the report also talks about health sector expenditure uh, uh, patterns, talks about the fact that majority of the money uh, allocated to the health sector is going into salaries or compensation, and it's only a little that is going into service delivery. Again, that has also been with us for a very, very long time. I mean, I, I, I remember somewhere in 2006 where I did this work trying to review uh, expenditure patterns within the health sector in Ghana. And I think that paper is published in European Journal of uh, Administrative Science. I did a comprehensive review, and out of that, I think OECD also did a comprehensive review of funding flows within the health sector. And basically, these were the same issues that we flagged in the report, that most of the money that goes into the health sector is, is, is poured into a certain hole called item one, which used to be the, the budget name in those days. And it is still the same. And, and it used to be the case that in those times, the health sector could run because of the basket funds that used to be in the health sector. So even if government of Ghana money was going into uh, uh, compensation, 
donor money could go into what service delivery unfortunately now the situation has changed with 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 donors moving away from uh, uh health funds into what you call budget support and sector budget support money goes into ministry of finance and sometimes by the time it gets to the health sector it's 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 a different ball game so this is an issue that we all need to look at now if you look at the 2016 uh, budget proposal and the allocation that is given to the health sector for what you call uh, um, uh, purchase procurement of what goods and services. If you look at that amount of money, yesterday I was having a discussion with one person from the health sector, and to what I was told, it is not even enough to procure the vaccines that are needed. So, if as, assuming they decide to use that money for vaccines, forget about reproductive health. Nothing is going there. And so it is an issue which is well captured that I think uh, uh, it's also uh, important. Then you look at the decomposed reproductive health expenditure as a percentage of uh, reproductive health receipts, which you see is what? Fluctuating. And again, that I guess is a function of the fluctuating nature of donor money because for reproductive health, most of it is financed by donors. It's only a small portion that is financed by government of Ghana money. Unfortunately, the government of Ghana money today has also become what? quite erratic and unpredictable. And so for me, that is also a point well captured. And then re utilization of reproductive health services. The report clearly states that there has been lots of uh, improvement with the exception of uh, family planning services. I've done, uh, I've recently sent a paper to Oxford health, health Policy Planning, and I've been looking at reproductive health services from 1998 to 2008. And there are issues that I'm finding, which is, I mean, you, you, you were looking at things like if you do disaggregated urban rural analysis, you are beginning to see that in urban centers, things like consumption of reproductive health services is going down. And that's one thing I will talk about later. You look at health delivery, it's going down, as, especially at urban centers. And there are implications for all uh, uh, these things. They also talk about shortage of staff, which, which is also important. I worked about 14 weeks in Upper West Region, and I come through almost everywhere in Upper West Region. And I'll never forget the story. I was trained my first degree as an accountant. I did ACCA. But then I had the opportunity to do some work in Upper West Region in the health sector for about 14 weeks, and it changed my whole horizon. And then I told my dad, I'm no longer interested in being a chartered accountant. And so I decided to go and do a master's in health policy. And I'll never forget that experience. This doctor I met at Laura Hospital, who had just been posted there because he had come from Russia with a wife. The, the doctor is a gynecologist, the wife a pediatrician. Unfortunately, the wife left because the wife couldn't stay. What they are, the, the wife is also a Russian with, with their little baby. And it was left with this doctor alone. And this doctor was performing a minimum of 10 surgeries a day. And I was asking myself, how can you do 10 surgeries a day? And that wasn't all. He comes in the morning, he goes, to the, the, he goes for ward rounds, from ward rounds, he goes to the OPD. From OPD, then he enters the theater. And sometimes he leaves the theater 10 o'clock. And he tells me that he just can't leave the people. And that experience, I will never, ever forget. And whenever I go to the classroom, it's one story I always tell my students, that if somebody could do this, and you have opportunity to control resources, I am imploring you to ensure that you do not take a penny out of it, because taking a penny out of it means somebody dying. And so I know the story, because I remember in Upper West around that time, when the doctor-patient ratio was around somewhere around 1 to 15,000. I know the story around Cesala. I know the sto story around Kelu. I know the story around Hamile. And so for me, capturing these things here is very, very important. And poor levels of equipment, which is all over the sector. Even if you take Kolebu, 
which is supposed to be our premier gem. I'm sure we know what the story is like. And so we may not even need to what, emphasize so much on Upper West, which is so far away, or Upper East, which is so far away. I'll give you a typical story. I remember when I came in and uh, my son had an infection and so was having temperature and went to the Legon Hospital. So when we got there, they said we have to go to the emergency. And I entered the emergency and I was like, what? Is this the emergency? They said yes. And I was comparing it to St. Mary's Hospital in Manchester, which I'm used to. And so I told the doctor, you know what? I am not coming in here. You are coming out from this emergency and you take care of this boy. The doctor said, that is not what is done. I said, I don't care. You must know what your infection control protocols are. And that little kids don't have the capacity to withstand shocks. And so I'm not bringing the baby. I managed to get that doctor out of uh, 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 the so-called uh, emergency to come out and take care of the. And here I'm talking about Legon Hospital. So I can imagine the sort of pediatric emergency we would have in what? Upper West. So it's, it's a story well captured over here. Now, having talked about this, I, I, I would want to end my review by trying to look at some kind of important things captured in this report and its ramifications. So the growing importance of IGF, and I want us to look at its implications on the sustainability of the national health insurance. I mean, one of the best things that is happening to us as a country is the national health insurance. But the point is that we all have a collective stake to ensuring that this program, this pro poor program, is what? Sustained and is made to work. Because the point here is that if we see IGF growing in that manner and become very relevant for reproductive health, then it means that it is your responsibility, my responsibility, to ensure that the NHIS works. Because if it doesn't work, then we are going to get very soon to the situation where people get to Kolebu, they get to a hospital, and they are asked to pay. And because they can't pay, their babies ought to be delivered on a floor. What a good welcome. Because for me, I remember when my baby was born, the first thing that was done by the British government was to say congratulations to my wife and to give her 500 pounds. Oh. Yes. <laughs> for, for bringing forth what? A state asset. Yes, that's, that's how, for bringing forth a state asset. And so it is important that we look at this. Then we talk about uh, uh, acute shortage of staff in the northern regions. Again, it comes back to the issue of the health insurance. I've always met policymakers and I've said that, look, if we can let this health insurance work, work so well, such that it is able to pay, such that it is able to pay the hospitals market prices for the services that they render then we can tell government enough is enough, take your hands off, let us run our own hospitals, and doctors will be paid well. Because the question I ask is that if a doctor is being paid what is due them, okay, and the services are in Upper West, of course the, 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 the prevalence of illnesses is more in Upper West than in Greater Accra. So if you want an investor who wants money, I mean, it's obvious that they would rather put a hospital in Upper West rather than putting it in Accra. The only reason why today they will not want to do that is that if they put in Upper West, they will not get their investment back. But if we have a properly functioning uh, insurance system that is able to pay for the services rendered, you will find private people wanting to put state-of-the-art hospitals in Upper West because that is where the market is. And so that is the kind of discussion I want us to be having. Rather than talking about this is NPP, this is NDC, unfortunately, the politicians always succeed to get us to talk about what they want to hear so that we don't talk about what is in our interest. Then the last thing I will want to talk about is the issue of rising skill delivery in the context of increasing maternal mortality. Because it doesn't make sense to me. Because if people are delivering in the hospitals, 
Why is it that they are still uh, 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 delivering and coming home with such uh, sad stories? Why is it that women are still dying even in the hospital? The answer is simple. They get to the hospital when the case is already what, bad. So then it means we need to begin to move away from the micro story to the macro story. I mean, there is incredible evidence in the economics literature, in the demography literature, about the kinds of things that we need to do to deal with maternal mortality. The reason why Britain has two or three per 100,000 live births, Australia or those countries, is because when the woman is in labor, there is, there is access road. I mean, it takes just about a maximum of five minutes anywhere in Britain to be able to reach a hospital. So the access roads are there. The facilities are there. I remember when, when, when because it was mandatory for me to be going with my wife on, on, on uh, antenatal care, and it was even mandatory for me to attend antenatal classes. <laughs> yes, it's mandatory for me to attend antenatal classes. And I remember they asking my wife, make a choice whether you want to give birth at home or you want to come. And if you want to give birth at home, what they do is that they place an ambulance on standby. If there is any complication, quickly they, they whisk you to the theater. And I said, no, we want uh, it at the hospital. Okay, so the bigger point is to be able to, to look at the macro picture, the facilities, the access roads, I mean, somebody is sick in Hamily, or a woman gets into labor in Hamily, and they are supposed to come to Laura, the nearest what, hospital. I'm sure you've used that road before. You know how that road is. By the time they get to Laura, if something hasn't happened, the baby probably is dead. <coughs> so we need to be talking about the bigger picture. We need to be talking about what? Equipment in there. We need to be talking about the distribution of facilities. And then, of course, we need to be talking about the major issue, which is household resources. I mean, it is incredible for me that the last paper that I did, I looked at 1998 to 2008, because that was the data available to me. And you see the biggest, most important influence in terms of consumption of reproductive health services is household wealth. And that doesn't make sense to me in a country where we say that what? Access to reproductive health services is free. Now, the bigger issue is what in economics we call the opportunity cost. Because the opportunity cost of service consumption is so high. A woman in Hamile would look at how much it is going to cost her not just how much she pays at the hospital, but if I go to the hospital, I don't get to go to my farm. If I don't get to go to my farm, I probably will not eat for the next three days. My kids will also not eat for the next three days. So in that case, I won't go to the hospital. I'd rather go to my farm. So the opportunity cost of going to the hospital is so high. And for rational human beings, the option is to choose what? Going to their farm. So until we begin to deal with what? Resource distribution and poverty, we are going nowhere with achieving a uh, safe motherhood. Thank you very much. The viewer needs a better applause than we gave him. I am sure from now onwards, when we pick up a copy of this report, we'll read it with a lot of meaning, a lot of emotion, a lot of understanding, and a lot of passion. So um, I join my colleagues and senior friends from the high table in launching the St. Ghana report, Making Safe Motherhood a Reality, the Issue of Financing. <laughs> So since we are religious, we, need, we launch it in the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in the name of Allah, amen. 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 All protocol observed. I think that um, a lot has been said regarding um, the report. And as a sector, I must say that we are very much committed to improving maternal health 
and we would like to, on that score, commend Send Ghana for initiating this um, project. I always want to say this because as a sector, there is a telling story of a little bird carrying a heap of huge documents. What that means is that we have a lot of these reports and um, research findings, a lot of policies on maternal health. But for us, the key thing is how to translate all these findings of research and policies into action. So as a sector, we are committed to ensuring that these research findings, especially what we just heard from SENT, will be put into um, policies, not just put in policies, but then we look forward to ensuring that it goes directly into implementation. The challenges of achieving strides in maternal health is known. I mean, it's nothing new. So when we talk about lack of um, funds, we talk about budgetary issues and all that. These are known, but we would want to say that we need a collaborative effort in ensuring that we achieve our aim of reducing maternal mortality. So on behalf of um, the Director PPME of the Ministry of Health, I would like to one more time thank Send Ghana for this wonderful report. Thank you very much. And government is committed. As such, health sector is the second highest being allocated resources. Government will do its best to allocate health facilities in all the streets and make it accessible to all. The health sector is putting up a project which is allocating allocation of health resources in all, you know, on and self areas, we have 1,500 and 1,500 cheap compounds to be constructed in in the country. You know, the package is um, small. The resources are very limited. However, government is doing its best to lo locate, allocate resources to the sector. All the sectors are as well competing for the same resources. So we should also help ourselves with the ideas that we generate. <laughs> yes, it, it should help us. It should help us. Government is doing its best. And we are all supposed to contribute our bit. St. Ghana is doing well. Christian Aid is doing well. We really appreciate your efforts. And we all do well. Government is very committed and we do our best. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And listening to um, Dr. I want to mention your name properly. <laughs> Dr. Bekan Kroma speaking about the, the doctor he met at Laura. I, I thought he was um, referring to me. I'm also a medical doctor by profession. I'm a public health physician. And between the year 2007 and 2012, I was a medical soup at Bechim Government Hospital. And for three out of the five years that I worked there, I was the only medical doctor at that hospital. And Bechim is a district, Tano South District. There is only one hospital with no maternity home in the whole district. So every delivery in the district will come to Bechim Government Hospital. And here I was, one doctor. You are both the hospital manager. You sign the checks. You go for meetings. You do your ward rounds. You do your surgeries. Um, that has been my worst experience as a, as a practitioner. That was when I realized that we had a big problem in this country. 
I completed medical school in a class made up of 110 doctors. I did my housemanship at Techiman, Holy Family Hospital. We were quite a number. So from there, uh, my hometown is Wenchi. That's where my dad comes from. There was no doctor at Wenchi Medical Hospital. So my dad asked me to go and work there to, to help his kinsmen. When I went there, I managed to convince two of my mates to join me at uh, Wenchi. So we were three. There was only one doctor at Bichim. And then he left, so there was no doctor there. And so the director at the time said, when she cannot have three doctors, whilst Bichim had none. So me being the senior, I was asked to leave when she to go and work at Bichim. And when I went there first, I looked at where I was going to sleep. I wept. So I couldn't asked my wife to join me because I knew if my wife comes and, you know, she sees some of these things. You know, women and how sensitive they are. She may not like it. So I said, fine, let me endure the troubles till I've managed to, you know, make the place a bit fine before I will ask her to join me. She's a nurse anyway, so we work together. But uh, the story is, this country, we have a lot of doctors. Our problem is the distribution. Bechim is a 64-bed capacity hospital. I was the only doctor. I had one anesthetist. I had one medical assistant who supported me at the OPD. One of my nurses had a transfer to join his husband, her husband in Accra. So she was posted to Amasaman Government Hospital, which is 25-bed capacity. Guess what? They had one doctor who was a medical director. They had one ONG specialist. They had six medical doctors, six medical assistants, and six nurse anesthetists in a 25-bed capacity hospital. So when this nurse of mine went to Amazon, she called. It was like there was no work for her to do. This is the problem we are facing in Ghana. Uh, Dr. Abeka was talking about the macro, you know, situation. Most professionals want to work at places looking at what goes on around them. So sometimes even posting people to go to search how to reach areas become a problem because he doesn't see why he should move to such a deprived area. And he's taking the same remuneration as a colleague of his who is working in a well-to-do place with little to do. So um, I think our biggest challenge as a country is a resource distribution, be it human or financial. And we have always been playing to the gallery in tackling this issue. We've always been hearing these issues about we are going to distribute the human resource adequately, but at the end of the day, we come back to square one. Um, before I was introduced, uh, the MC was talking about we approving the budget. When I was going to parliament, I had a lot of hopes. I thought there was a lot that I could do. That was why I decided to leave the clinic and go. We were complaining every day. We go for annual review meetings. You know, we have a nice, uh, you know, format. You talk about your your uh, key performance indicators in the in, in the in the year. Then you go to your challenges. You go to way forward. It was like a chorus. Every year, you know, resources are not released on time. Lack of human capacity. Way forward. Then we hope that we are good with resources adequately next year we get the same problem. So I said, why am I always complaining about some of these? Let me also get to where the decisions are made so that maybe the people do not understand how it actually feels not to solve the problems. But when I got to parliament, <laughs> reality dawned on me <laughs> that parliament as we see it, we do not even have a teeth to bite. Our constitution has made so many challenges for parliament. We can't increase 
the budget, we can only reduce it. <laughs> that is the only thing Parliament can do. Parliament cannot initiate a bill by virtue of how the constitution is. Everything will have to come from the executive. And you see, uh, when the chair, the, the Sen, uh, Ghana, West Africa, as you was talking, he said Sen Ghana has become the unofficial research assistance for parliament. That is the truth. We barely have documents proving work with. We are supposed to oversight the institutions. We don't have any information to even critique them. We use the information they give us to critique them. So how do you expect a student who is asked to set his own questions and answer and give the question to a teacher who doesn't know the, 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 the area to, to mark and fill that student? He's always going to set cheap questions, answer them, and then when he gives, he also gives you the marking scheme so that you mark and give you 100%. That's what happens in Parliament. We are in the budget you know, season. After the budget, we are going to go to the estimates. We will meet all the agencies under the Ministry of Health to go through their program work for the year, how they fed. All the documents we are going to review will come from them. So are we expecting them to give us any information that will indict them? Unlike the Public Accounts Committee, who works with the audit report so that they will be able to assess the MDs. We don't have anything. Parliament should have gotten a very well-resourced research agency that will go to these MDs, get information, just like Sen Ghana has done, so that when you meet the, the, the agency heads, you'll be able to critique their performances and make sure they do the right thing. But you don't have this support. So sometimes, with your background as a technocrat, you sit in parliament and you wonder, are you actually being of you know, any help to, to the people of Ghana? I don't know what all of us can do to support because the way things are, if we do not really do something to help the system, I'm moving into the, the financing mechanism in the health se sector. Now, IGF has become the main source of financing. I think Dr. Nkrumah Abeka said it nicely. Before the NHIS started in 2005, we had GOG administration, GOG service, donor pool funds, which are coming to almost all the health institutions. So even if people don't even pay their hospital bills, you know that you are going to get some money, some fees, so that you'll be able to use that to, you know, help. With NHIS, all these sorts of funds ceased. The only source to the institutions has been the IGF. What about the health directories who do not have any source of IGF? A year will end and their releases will not be even up to 20%. So they can't do anything. They cannot supervise the hospitals and the clinics. They don't have money to buy fuel. They can't, some of them cannot even buy A4 sheets so that they can write their reports. Some of them will now have to depend on the hospitals to get money from the IG so that they will be able to run the directories. This is what is going on. Recently, I'm sure some of you may, may be aware, the Greater Regional Health Directorate, it shares office with uh, National Service Secretary. They had their lives cut, uh, disconnected for more than three weeks because they are owing ECG to the tune of 50,000 Ghana cities. I went there to get a document. I had to take it, go outside to go and make a photocopy and bring the document back because there was no source of light at their premise. Listen, we just all protocol observe. Thank you very much for the opportunity for the Government Insurance Committee from Parliament to be part of this uh, meeting. The story is told of a, a carpenter and a friend. When their friend lost the child, and then the carpenter gave him a coffin. 
Then he went to thank him. So when he went, he said, oh, thank you, my dear friend, for donating the coffin. He said, don't worry. It's because your children don't die. But any time they die, you are sure of getting a coffin from me. The, the friend wasn't pleased. Naturally, I would have expected that when somebody does kindness to you, you will reciprocate by, what, by thanking the person. But in this case, the friend wasn't uh, enthused at all. Because when it comes to death, numbers do not matter. So whether it is 185, whether it is 200, even if it is five, like by the child person asks, who is going to be part of this number? So when it comes to maternal and child mortality, we cannot say that our figure is low, so we are okay. Sh or what we should aim at should be what? Zero. Because we should not expect a woman to go to the hospital to deliver, or deliver at home, and then either she loses her life or she loses the child. Because we all know the agony that people go through when loved ones are lost, especially when they are babies. For the fact that we don't even know how they are, they, 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 what they will have been. My wife is a medical practitioner, I mean, she's a health service delivery practitioner. She works at the Dodua Health Research, and she's into maternal and child mortality. So I read, I co I mean, author most of her research works. So I understand what goes on in, I mean, uh, child and child, 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 maternal and child health issues. But this is not the issue for now. If you look at the budget, first let me go to what uh, my colleague, Dr. No. Incidentally, he is a member of my committee too. But he is a member of the select committee. You know, we have select committees and standing committees. My committee is a standing committee, government assurances. But he is on the select committee for health. So most of the pressure, I think, we even will have to come from his outfit because they can push for more. What we do at government assurances, I will come to that in a bit. Eh? But if you look at the National Development Planning Commission analysis of the 2016 budget, they've made us aware that in spite of all the development that has, has taken place from 1990, come 27 days to come, like the doctor said, when we are supposed to end the year, there is no way that we will achieve our target for what? Uh, maternal and child health is issues. So the question is, what do we do as a nation? But look, taking a clue from what you said about the budget, as a military personnel, I know we have something we call impress. I don't know how you call it in the civil distance. Impress means that you are giving some amount of money to spend and then come and account. I, I, for my, my three and a half years in parliament, I think that in Ghana, we give impress to the government departments and agencies. It's not a budget. Because for me, if you want me to come out a budget, you give me a tax, and I tell you how much we enable me, I mean, accomplish that tax. So when I can, then we can judge you and say, okay, I need about 2,000 cities to accomplish, I mean, accomplish this tax. Then you tell me, maybe work something about it. Then maybe I come to about 150 cities instead of 200. But the situation where you say, okay, I've given you 200 cities, use it for the year. I, I don't call it budget. I call it impress allocation. Because you have to work within that amount of money that you've been given. And naturally, each ministry, each department will first of all look at its uh, priority from the salaries. Because if for one minute, one month, we don't pay workers in Ghana, you and I cannot survive. Whether you are a private businessman, whether you are a, a, a big shot in any organization or not, you cannot stand it. So naturally, the departments will want to do what? Pay their workers first. And when they allocate so much to uh, salaries and allowances, you realize that what is left for goods and services is so minimal that if you take the Minister of Health, yeah. technically speak, speaking, despite the fact that Madam Finance Minister said they give them a, 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 a light chunk, you cannot even build a, a clinic, in a, one clinic in the whole country in a year. So the, the problem that we are facing is that, I mean, finance, that financially, as a country, we are not so sound to take care of our, our needs. So when I look at it, it's a making safe matter with the reality, the issue of financing. From the government point of view, we are not able to support our health service delivery system. If you take that out of the equation, even take the case of women who go to hospitals, like doctor said, if you say that you have made a service free and there's the distance, for example, between where you are, your place of abode and where you, you are going, 
There are other facilities that detect the pace at which people want to go to hospital. I remember my wife did a project on Jomro, my constituency, my district, and uh, on the utilization of, how do you call it, uh, maternal health services in the, in, the in the district. And when she did the interviews, somebody said that the nature of the road is so bad that he, she will not even advise her worst enemy to, to use that road when she's pregnant. So you can imagine. And sometimes taxes will charge different fares. So if the woman considers the amount of money she will have to spend from the, hospital, from the house to the hospital, not talking about what the nurses will tell her to bring, then she will better stay at home and then what? Deliver. So when we are looking at uh, financial issues for uh, making motherhood safe, the reality on the ground is that even though there is a, na a national policy that it is free, there are other unforeseen costs that makes it not free. It makes it even rather expensive. So these are the issues that, as policymakers, we should take a look at. But for us, from the Government Assurance Committee, we cannot necessarily influence sector ministries to either increase or decrease budget. But what we can do, because we have seen over the years that, as a people, we know all the issues, we know all the problems, but the issue that, the problem that we have as a nation is implementation. The, the basic problem is implementation. We all know that this amount of money is meant to be used to maybe, uh, uh, how do you call it, to be used to renovate a, a hospital. Now, the, the big man comes to stand and says that, oh, this hospital will be renovated in six weeks' time, especially with the politician. We speak and then they clap for us. <laughs> but give the person one year, and where has all started? The money will be given to somebody who will start buying four wheel drives first, buying I mean, vehicles for his girlfriend first. So by the time he starts, the money is even finished. So the, the, the question is when will the project be completed? Sometimes one project will reoccur in the budget every year continuously for about four years. So for us at government assurances, what we do is that we hold government accountable to ensure that what it says it will do, it actually does it. So when the budget statement comes out, and then the Minister of Finance comes in to defend it, and par Parliament approves, we ensure that what has been approved is what? Done. I remember when we took some talk to Ashanti Region, Kofanochi Hospital, Tafu Hospital. If you go to Tafu Hospital now, you weep. Because for a project, it is the Tafu Maternity, Maternity, Maternity Home. Since 2000 and what? Doc? Since 2000 and what? 2000 and, is it? Four. 204. 204. The hospital is still not complete. complete. You see? So as a committee, we visited there, and then we called the Minister of Health to come and answer, and give us another assurance that, I mean, that project will be what? Completed. But the interesting thing is that sometimes, you see, whilst we are holding uh, ministers accountable for their works, we realize that a minister comes in 2007. He's, he gives an assurance to the Government Assurance Committee that a project will be completed in 2009. By 2008, he's changed. The next person who comes says that, yes, indeed, it has been made, but because of ABCD, we cannot. So we have to wait for another assurance. So what we can say as a committee <laughs> is that we will continue to push the buttons in ensuring that what government has said it will do, it will do. Because we believe that a report like what St. Ghana has made it gives us the opportunity to know what is happening on the ground, and then it gives us the impetus to push certain ministers who have made certain assurances or promises in ensuring that what they have said they will do, they actually do it. And that is how far as a community we can go. We'll continue to do that. That is what we can ensure. So for St. Ghana and uh, Christian Aid, we want to say are equal for the good job done. But for government assurance committee, we will ensure that we keep pushing. We keep pushing. Because, you see, when you say government assurance committee, a lot of sometimes it's very funny. Because when you come to that committee, you will not know who is from the majority or who is from the minority. We speak as representatives of the people of Ghana. And we hold government accountable, irrespective of the party colors that we wear. When it comes to those issues, we do not discriminate. We work together as a team. And this is what we will continue to do in ensuring that 
the people of Ghana are giving their due. On that note, I want to thank all of you for making it possible for us to be part of it. God bless you all. That almost all the things that have been catalogued, they are not necessarily new. We know all of them. And in fact, in general, if you look at the kind of interventions you need to implement to ensure that you can deal with maternal mortality, it's known across the world and it's available in the literature. What we need is commitment and commitment with a certain passion to do the right investment and monitor them and see those investments through. And I also think that we've oftentimes focused too much on the micro situation. So about maybe investment in equipment for emergency obstetric care, staff in the hospital. Yes, that is fine, but that is only one side of the equation. We need to look at the macro picture because I've talked about issues of looking at the correlation between wealth and reproductive health intake going up, and that's, that, that is not right. So it means we need to deal with, with the situation of poverty. We need to deal with the situation of income inequality. Now you look at issues of access roads, availability of health facilities. We need to deal with these things because overall, these macro level situation tends to have impact in terms of the decision to use. We need to deal with issues of women's education because if we even invest in the micro situation and we don't deal with macro, these macro level variables, we basically won't achieve our targets. So we heard from both the Parliamentary Select Committee mm. on Health and then the assurance, Government Assurances Committee. Mm. Uh, and we don't seem to get an assurance that something can be done about all the findings and recommendations that you have made. Where does that leave us? I mean, sometimes when I look at this, I say that uh, as a society, I think that sometimes the citizenry is being a bit dormant, okay? We need to begin to demand accountability from our elected uh, officials because we need to b bring pressure on them because I've seen it in elsewhere, the citizens ensure that they bring a lot of pressure to bear on their elected officials to ensure that they work. Otherwise, I mean, they would just talk in the official position and say, we would try and do our bit to get assurances from government. At the end of the day, if the citizens demand from government that our, their government must do what they are elected to do, then I think we can be seeing progress. Because point is that we know what to do. What we need is commitment to get it done. Most of these citizens you talk about are the one tends to be the bane of uh, developing countries because the, the middle class who can agitate and ask that government should do these things sometimes decide not to do it because they can afford it. But then the point is that we, it, it's also about education and to have some kind of collective conscience as a people that it is not just about us, it's about a society that we're building. Yes, you cannot build your own hospital. You may be able to afford a private one, but the point is that you can get into a private institution that will not be able to take care of your needs. And so it is, it is important, and it's all part of the development process. It's important that we get it that this is one Ghana. It's our collective Ghana, and we must make sure our voices are heard and hold our leaders to account to ensure that they do what they are supposed to do for our collective because good. Well, because as I said in my speech, it's very, very painful for a woman to go into the labor ward and not come out, or come out without her baby. I've seen too many of her. I've heard too many, and too many people close to me have gone through it, and as I speak to you, I even have goosebumps. It is very painful. It, I, I don't know what to compare to it, because you see people go through pregnancy. Some of them, the stress, the sleepless nights, the sickness, the up and down, the struggles they go through, and then they lose a baby due to either um, negligence, lack of facility, timeliness, you know, absence of a health professional. And no matter the reason, I believe it should not happen. Unless it is God that ordained that she should die. So I'm, I'm very passionate about it because I know it is very painful. Not that I've had a personal experience, but I've known too many people who have gone through that. We wouldn't do too much politics, but should we say our um, previous government and succeeding ones don't see the health sector as a problem? Yeah, that, this was a right from the beginning. I mean, I, I don't know, at least the government that I have seen, I have witnessed.
you know, in my 45 years or on earth, I don't think they attach much importance to issues of health. And especially when it comes to maternal, you know, this, you know, um, foolish idea that we have that, oh, pregnancy is not a disease. People went and they came. So, I mean, it shouldn't be a big deal. But it is a big deal. It is a big deal. Even the mode of conception, period of going through pregnancy, delivery, and after delivery. I know women who have gone to the hospital, delivered, come home, and even sometimes two, three weeks, sometimes months after, they die due to circumstances that nobody understands. Some of them lose it mentally. Postnatal um, 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 depression, postnatal depression. They, go, they lose it mentally. Some of them lose their babies. I mean, the baby is born, they come home two, three months. Recently, one of my young ladies, she went to deliver. Just two, week, just two days ago, she sent me a text, Mommy, I'm still at the hospital. I said, ah, you came home. I came to see you. So what are you doing at the hospital? She had a CS, and she said when she was sleeping, I think uh, the breast milk somehow seeped into the cut. And so the cut has opened and become infected. It becomes something else. I don't understand how that could happen. That's a, but it's happened. You know, so in a local dialect, they say that's why when a woman goes to deliver and she comes, they wear white. It's like you've gone to a war front. You've gone to face and battle death. That's our situation here in Ghana. Pregnancy, going through pregnancy and going to deliver is going to war with death. And when you come, you have battled, you have overcome to come. And why should it be so? Well, the society loses a lot because we don't know who that person will be. That child that is lost. That woman that is lost. What, and <laughs> it's affected when the woman dies. The whole family is affected. A husband, if she has other children, the children are affected. We know what our society does with our women. The whole extended family depends on her. When somebody is old, it's the woman who has to go and take care of the grandparents or parents who have grown old. And look at Dr. Kamara, the country director for St. Ghana. I mean, he was a street boy who was identified by some people who helped him to become who he is today. And look at him, an asset. He could have been lost on the street. So you can never tell who somebody will be in future. That baby that is born today, you never know what he or she will become. So it does affect society in so many ways. In so many ways. Just imagine a woman or a, a father who is a CEO, who is in charge of a big government or an institution, loses the child or loses the wife. How effective is that? That's two, three months or four, sometimes a year, gone down the drain of unproductiveness. Because he doesn't even have the mind, presence of mind to work or to, give any, to achieve anything productive. Okay. How do we keep the way forward? What can we, we need to be serious. As our reviewer said, every person meant for the health sector must go in there. There must be monitoring. More money must be given to what the... the I mean, when you go through the summary of the report... Um, the executive summary tells you about government of Ghana going for a loan of 52 million euros in 2013. As of 2015, only 19% have been disbursed. Where's the rest of the money? Where's it going to? We need to be serious. We need to renumerate our doctors and health workers well. We need to resource our health cent centers. We need to make sure that we have good roads leading to health centers. You know, we need to get things working and be passionate about safe motherhood. Thank you very much. much. I think uh, it's a very good report. It actually paints the true picture of what is happening on the ground. It has shown that notwithstanding the difficulties we have having as a nation, we have come far. We've actually had some improvement in our indicators as far as maternal health is concerned but as we all got to know we were not able to meet 
the targets of the Millennium Development Goals, it shows that we are still a long way to go. We've been told that we have some sister countries which, who are just like us, like Paraguay, who are doing better. So all these should challenge us that we still have a long way to go. So in a whole, I would say that um, uh, the report will actually galvanize us to do more to ensure that we improve the lives of our mothers and our children. I think basically uh, we have realized that to improve maternal health, we have to improve um, antenatal attendance, we have to improve uh, deliveries. That is, we should get a lot more of our mothers delivering under skilled personnel. So we have to increase the number of supervised deliveries. We must also have more efficient and e effective way of managing our postnatal complications. So people must deliver and the hospital setting where we have comprehensive maternal and newborn care. And all these go with in financial investment, both in terms of infrastructure, equipment, and the human resource. So this is where the focus should be. We have to be able to improve the financial interventions in these areas. And from the report, we realized that the doctor-patient ratio, even though it has improved a bit, we still have a long way to go the WHO figure of one is to 600 doctor to patient ratio, we are so far from it. We are around one to 10,000. So we have to do more as far as that area is concerned. And then the bigger issue now is even how to ensure financial access because of the challenges, the health insurance authority, which has been the mainstay of creating financial access in the country is concerned. Uh, they have a difficulty now with finding enough resources to be able to take care of their, their, their budget. And I think that is where the focus should be for both the government and all the stakeholders to ensure that uh, we are able to take care of these difficulties to be able to move forward and improve on our performance indicators as far as maternal health is concerned. Now, now finally, uh, Doctor, you seem worried that uh, indeed when the budget is read, uh, you are unable as an MP Yes, I think Parliament, we are the representative of the people of Ghana. And the constitution gives the authority to Parliament to approve the budget before the government was spent through the Passive Appropriation Act. But this same constitution more or less ties the hands of Parliament to the extent that we cannot change the figures upwards, we can only reduce a figure. So I guess if you've been given the authority to approve something, then you should have the latitude and leverage to you know tinker out the figures either to increase or reduce but unfortunately uh, the constitution does not allow us to have that leverage that's why we think that it actually do not allow parliament to perform our functions effectively so i think something has to be done with the constitutional arrangement to enable us to be able to influence the budget positively to ensure that we can direct the executive to put the resources at where we are going to get the best benefit for the people of the country, who, which we represent in parliament. That we call St. Ghana working in partnership with its development partners, such as Christian Aid and the European Union, recognize that the issues of maternal health are becoming preeminent in, in Ghana to the extent that we're looking at the MDG goals. As a result of that, we put uh, a project dubbed the Improve, Improving Maternal Health Care Through Participatory Governance. A component part of it is to do a research on maternal health and looking at budget tracking. The critical issues in the maternal health care sector lies in the area of inadequate resources. That is one of the problems besides this ineffective utilization of related governance systems. There is also the problem of inadequate or lack of functional equipment in most of the health facilities. Because we realize that many ambulances are grounded, especially in deprived areas, and that is affecting the delivery of maternal health care outcomes. As a result, we set out to assess the financial investment 
into maternal health care services and how that is translating into outcomes in the three regions of northern Ghana. Okay. Um, conducting this research, did you find, um, did you face some challenges in gathering your facts? In the process of gathering the data, we face a few challenges in the sense that in some cases you realize that data that was given were quite inaccurate. We also find out in some areas we had sketchy data and we also realize that in some cases some of the health facilities did not cooperate by giving us the data. And so what we did was to work with the health facilities that gave us the data. We also got a lot of cooperation from some of the district and the health facilities I must put on record. What do you aim at after all this research? Well, what is the outcome? What do, you, what do you want to achieve, Sen Ghana? At the end of this research, you know, Sen is a public research and advocacy organization. So we intend to make sure that we hold policy dialogues at the regional, district, and national levels to ensure that public office holders who are the guidance of the implementation of government policy you know, make commitments in terms of what they can do to improve the situation, what can be done to improve the situation, for example, of the poor distribution of medical doctors, especially in the deprived and recently created districts, what could be done to improve the speedy flow of resources transfers to the district, hospitals and health centers so that we can work effectively and reduce maternal mortalities. We also need to work with the hospitals and these facilities to ensure that the resources that are speedily disbursed from government are effectively used in the provision of logistics and equipment such as beds and also in the insurance of promotion of family planning services that is becoming a critical problem in the northern part of Ghana. These, we will continue to work closely with the media, we will continue to work closely with the public health sector workers. This will continue to work closely with citizens at the community level who are empowered to ask the enabling questions to ensure that public office holders, especially at the district level, sit up and dispense medical services in a way that improve the well-being, especially of women. Thank you.